In the oceans, the distribution of life depends on the availability of two things, sunlight and nutrients. Nutrients are the fertilizers of the ocean plants and algae. Phytoplankton, seaweed, and marine plants form the base of marine food web in the open and coastal ocean. And just like nutrients or fertilizers are needed in your vegetable garden, they're also required by seaweed, marine plants, and phytoplankton. Areas in the ocean with high availability of these nutrients will therefore allow a considerable growth of algae. We call these high productivity areas. These locations are often blooming with ocean life. The coast of California and the coast of South Africa are examples. If you spend a bit of time on the coast here in California, you have probably spotted pods of Pacific white-sided dolphins, gray whales, humpback whales, or perhaps even a blue whale. The abundance of marine mammals along our coast is a function of this high productivity and therefore availability of nutrients. What are these nutrients? And most importantly, how do they become available to the microalgae and seaweed? The main nutrients are nitrogen and phosphorus. Carbon is also an important nutrient for algae growth. But since carbon is a basic component of all organic compounds, they're present in abundance in abundance in the oceans. So they do not, it does not limit algae growth. The nutrients that limit algae growth are mainly nitrogen and phosphorus. When these three nutrients are not limiting productivity, the ratio of carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus in the tissue of algae is in the proportion of 106 to 16 to 1. This is called the red food ratio after the American oceanographer Alfred Red Food. This ratio is described in zooplankton that feeds in diatoms and in most water samples taken worldwide. When these algae and zooplankton die, the carbon, the nitrogen, and the phosphorus in their tissue is recycled back into the water column. The nitrogen and phosphorus would then be stored in deeper and darker layers of the ocean. And they become available when these deeper layers of water move upwards in the process that we call upwelling. Nitrogen and phosphorus can also become available via runoff. But let's take a, a look at upwelling first. These two images shows coastal upwelling on the Oregon, California coastline. In the Northern hemisphere, coastal upwelling can be caused by winds blowing from the north along the west coast of a continent. This will cause the surface water to move offshore in the process that we call Ekman transport. The surface waters will then be replaced by cold nutrient rich deep waters in the upwelling process, bringing the nutrients and fueling or fertilizing the, the uh, phytoplankton that occurs suspended in the water column. The image on the right shows a satellite view of the US West Coast and the growth of phytoplankton is stimulated by upwell nutrients. The color bar indicates the concentration of chlorophyll in milligrams per cubic meter of seawater. Notice that the chlorophyll concentration is highest near the coast. This cycling of nutrients from non-living reservoirs, such as the water column, into the marine food web, and then, which could also happen between sediments or the atmosphere and the into the marine food web, is referred to as the biogeochemical cycle. Let's take a look at the biogeochemical cycle of nitrogen for an example. Nitrogen is an essential is essential for the formation of amino acids and proteins. The nitrogen reservoirs includes the atmosphere or the air, where about 78% of the air is nitrogen gas. However, nitrogen gas is unreactive 
and it cannot be used directly by phytoplankton. Only nitrates, nitrite or ammonia are useful to phytoplankton, the marine producers. The phytoplankton then gets help from nitrogen fixing oceanic bacteria, which can convert nitrogen gas dissolved in the ocean into ammonia in a process called nitrogen fixation. These organisms are important as they make nitrogen available to the rest of the producers, the diatoms, the dinoflagellates, seaweed, and the marine plants. The bacterium Prochlorococcus is the most abundant in the smallest marine cyanobacteria, reaching about 0.6 microns in diameter. Another type of oceanic bacteria, oceanic cyanobacteria, is Trichodesmium and Cynococcus. These two can also fix nitrogen from the dissolved form into ammonia. Once nitrogen is found in the form of ammonia, it can enter the food web. Ammonia can also be transformed into nitrate and nitrite by a process called nitrification. Nitrate and nitrite can be uptaken by producers and therefore enters the marine food web. Nitrogen will exit the marine food web when plants and animals die and decompose or when animals excrete. Nitrogen goes through a process called ammonification and it's converted back into ammonia. Nitrate and nitrite cycle back into nitrogen gas during a process called denitrification. This flow chart shows the nitrogen cycle from the atmosphere into the food web and back. The next diagram shows how nitrogen cycles in the ocean. You can see nitrogen gas fixed by bacteria before entering the marine food web. Also note how nitrification and denitrification occurs below the euphotic zone or the sunlit area of the ocean. It's important to point out that excess nitrogen can lead to the eutrophication of coastal waters. I mentioned before that nutrients are to marine producers what fertilizers are to garden plants. The fertilizers used in the garden plants, specifically in the farm fields, have nitrogen in their composition. So when water runs off the surface of the earth and arrives in the ocean, it brings these farm fertilizers into the coastal ocean. This extra amount of nitrogen input in the coastal waters generates accidental fertilization in the oceans. When too much nitrogen is added, algae will overgrow, leading to this eutrophication process. This picture shows the algae cleanup in Qingdao, China, before the 2008 Olympic sailing events. The Chinese government undertook a massive cleanup of floating green algae in order to host the Olympic Games, specifically the sailing competition. The cleanup effort involved tens of thousands of people that removed about 682 million metric tons of algae. That's equivalent to 1.5 trillion pounds of algae and an estimated cost of $87.3 million. Eutrophication of coastal waters can lead to dead zones. Dead zones are low oxygen regions related to the excess nutrients from agricultural runoff that stimulates algal blooms. When the algae in these blooms die, <clears throat> decomposition takes place. Decomposition is a chemical process that consumes vast amounts of oxygen, thereby depleting the water column from oxygen and creating these anoxic or hypoxic dead zones that can kill marine life 
by suffocating them since there's no oxygen in the water column for them to breathe. These two maps show the population density in brown and documented dead zones in the red circles. Small black circles show where dead zones have been reported, but their size is unknown. The red circles are, uh, have different sizes since the size of the dead zone is known. Notice how many dead zones occur where large rivers enter the North Sea, enter the sea. The map above highlights the Gold Mississippi River drainage basin. The enlargement shows the extent of the 2011 Gulf of Mexico dead zone with the colors representing the dissolved oxygen concentration in parts per median or PPM. The Northern Gulf of Mexico dead zone is the second largest in the world, just after the dead zone in the Baltic Sea. The Gulf's dead zone appears to be related to the runoff of nutrients, especially nitrates from agricultural activities that are washed down the Mississippi River and eventually reaching the Gulf where they trigger algal blooms. As I mentioned before, once these algae die and rain down the sea floor, bacteria feed on them, depleting the water of oxygen, leading to the um, depletion of oxygen in the water column, which can then lead to the suffocation of animals that live in that area. To summarize, nutrients are the ocean's fertilizers. Nitrogen and phosphorus are the main limiting nutrients of phytoplankton growth. Upwelling and runoff delivers nutrients to the sea surface. Only nitrates or nitrate and ammonia are useful to producers. If excess nutrients arrive in the coastal ocean via runoff, eutrophication and dead zones may develop. <laughs>